How many of you this morning would say that you believe in the power of prayer? How many of you say, I believe in the power of prayer? Many of us. That's good. Good show of hands. Now, how many of you would be willing to admit this morning that you believe in the power of prayer, but you can admit this morning that you probably don't tap into it quite enough? How many could say that? Good, good, good. Honesty. I love honesty. Because I believe in the power of prayer, and I know that there are times where I am not tapping into it as much or as often as I could or as I can or even as I should. Because it's amazing when we think about the power of prayer. So why is it that we believe in the power of prayer, yet we don't tap into that as often as we could? I think there's a couple of different things. I think one of the main ones is is we don't necessarily feel confident. We, we don't necessarily know what to say. Now, I'm not talking about just in social situations when we're gathering with a group of people and we're praying. I mean sometimes just being alone, one-on-one, with God, in prayer, we lose the words. God, where do I start? What do I say? Well, well the good news is, let me just kind of just put this right out there up front. You don't have to say anything. Sometimes the best thing that we can do is just simply come before the presence of God and listen. Or we come into the presence of God and we just allow God to speak on our behalf. We have a Holy Spirit who groans when we can't even utter words, when we can't even articulate what we need to say to God. The Holy Spirit groans on our behalf. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful that you don't have to know what to say? And, but I think sometimes because we don't know what to say, we end up being a little bit stumbled, like, what do, what do I do? Maybe we don't pray with power and, and we don't pray as often as we should because we're, we're not confident or we get bored. How many of you have ever gotten bored praying? I've gotten bored praying. I've fallen asleep when I've prayed before. F- for real. Y'all are laughing. You've fallen asleep when I've prayed before too. <laughs> <clears throat> so let's just be honest this morning. But I mean, you know, I, I like, and, and I used to tell my students all the time because I was just trying to engage, when I was a youth pastor, I was trying to engage the youth in this understanding that they can pray to God and it's okay to fall asleep praying to God. Where else is a better place to fall asleep? Now, if it becomes a chronic thing, then we have to adjust. Maybe we want to pray a little bit, you know, sooner before we go to bed. You know, dear Lord, I thank you so much for, oh. Oh, no, uh, and Lord, where did I leave off? Oh, yeah, and uh, you are great. Uh, You know, so it kind of happens, doesn't it? It happens. Maybe we're distracted when we pray. Uh, You know, I know for me, I'll be in prayer. I'll say, Lord, I just want more. I want more of you. I want s'more of, well, s'mores sound really good right now. S'mores, that's a fall treat. It's fall. Wow, the leaves are falling. Did we mow the lawn? I got to put the fertilizer down. Did we do that? We gotta, I got to make sure the sprinkler system is turned off. You know? And so all of a sudden, we're in the middle of prayer, talking about how we want more of God, and now all of our to-do lists to start piling up, right? How many of you have been there? How many of you have been there? Right, absolutely. And then times, there's times when we're just intimidated, We're just intimidated by sometimes the the powerful prayers of the people around us. You know, there's times when even like in prayer meeting, um, you know, I I love to pray, but when I hear other people pray with incredible power, sometimes I'm like, wow, I don't measure up, you know. And then there's like other times where sometimes you're like standing around, you're like, okay, Elijah, you know, let's keep it, you know, keep it down a little, right? You get the, you know, they're calling down fire from heaven and, and, and you just sit there and you're like, I'm not that person. See, the greatest thing is, whatever person you are, whatever personality you have, that's what you bring to God in prayer. You don't have to be anybody different. You don't have to be like anybody else. You can be Moses, right? Or you can be Aaron. Aaron was the orator. Moses was the guy that was kind of stumbling and bumbling through. You can be who God created you to be in that moment because guess what? When you pray, where does God look? Right into your heart. He sees your heart. We're going to get to that in a few seconds. 
I have a confession to make um, during prayer meeting here on Wednesday nights. There are people that, that they sacrifice, they take one for the team, and they stand next to me when we pray. <laughs> because people don't like standing next to me. Because when I start to pray and, uh, and the Holy Spirit starts moving, you know, uh, you might get one of these, right? You might get a knee, a knee rock. I'm a knee rocker, right? So you get the knee rock. And then if we really start going, we get the double. The double. You know, and the double, man, that's, that's when things are really going. And then, and then all of a sudden you get the, the stepping and the walking in place. I've walked in place before, you know. And, and God bless Darren Nance, you know, because he usually takes one for the team and he stands. And, and there's often times where he has to, you know, he's just calming me down, bringing me down. You know, we're going to get through this. We're going to get through it. It's a workout. We get done praying and I'm like exhausted. Whew. <laughs> right? That's just my confession for you. So we're starting a new series called So That. That's an interesting title for a series, isn't it? So That. You know, because the reason why we titled it So That is because we want people to ask, So That What? So That What? So That has action. So That has meaning. It has intention. There's a purpose. And when we look at the prayers of Paul, especially the prayers that he prays for the church in the epistles, he prays So That prayers. They're powerful intentional, specific prayers that are meant to do something. He doesn't just pray and then say amen. He prays and he says, so that. Because he's communicating to the church. He's communicating to the people. He's communicating to you and I when we read those letters. And he specifically wants us to experience things. So he puts in this this tiny two-word phrase, so that. I love it. So we titled a series, So That, and we're going to look at the powerful prayers of Paul. Because the truth is this morning, I think if we're going to learn something about prayer throughout this series, it's to realize that our prayers are not specific enough. They're too general, and they're not specific, and a lot of times our prayers really lack power. Here's an example. We tend to sometimes, when we pray, sound like beauty queen contestants. Lord, we pray for world hunger and world peace, right? Well, that's a nice general prayer, and, I'm, and God is right along with you, and he's praying, I pray for, for, for world peace, and I pray for world hunger as well. But why? But why? What is it? What is it specifically that we could be praying that will engage God's heart, and which, which will then engage our heart to pray something more specific than just the general? We pray for world hunger and world peace. What about um, we pray the prayer, Lord, I want you to be with me. You know, think about that. Think about that. You know what God's saying in that moment? I, I told you in my word, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You know, so we're saying, be with me. And he's like, I'm right here. <laughs> right? Or we pray general prayers like, Lord, I want you to bless me. Just bless me. And I feel like sometimes God's kind of like, do you see where you live? <laughs> right? Do you realize that if you own a car, you are considered rich by the world's standards? You're rich. If you own a car, you are considered rich by the world's standards. And you, we say, Lord, I want you to bless me. And God's going, hello. You have a roof over your head. You have food in the cupboards. And I know that's not necessarily true for everybody, but I'm talking to us specifically when we get to that place of prayer. Realizing just generically and generally praying for, praying for God's blessing. God wants to know why. Why do you want to be blessed? How do you want to be blessed? When do you want to be blessed? Where do you want to be blessed? And if we can go into our prayer with powerful, our prayers are powerful and specific, then God will unlock things that we ourselves don't even have the ability to unlock. Isn't that good news? That's good news. So we also pray things like, God, protect my family. From what? Protect my family from what? What do you want me to protect your family from? I'll protect your family. You know, God's having this conversation with us. Of course. Of course. I love your family. I'll protect your family. But I want to hear from you. What do you want me to protect them from? How do you want me to protect them? See, here's the bottom line. The bottom line for us this morning is that general prayers don't move God to specific action. Let's say that together. 
general prayers don't move God to specific action. That's our bottom line this morning. I got an example for you here in Martin Luther. Martin Luther, you know, was the father of the Reformation. He had a friend and assistant named Frederick uh, Myconius. Frederick Myconius in 1540 was working with Luther hand in hand to reform the church. And Myconius got to the place in 1540 that he was about to die. He knew he was about to die. So he wrote his final letter to Luther and said, and said, Martin, I've loved working with you. I've loved reforming the church, but it is my time. I'm going to die. I just wanted to write this final letter to tell you how, how great of a work you're doing and how much you've blessed me. So Martin Luther, in that point, all of a sudden, he doesn't just write back and say to Myconius, oh, so sorry to hear that. I hope this letter gets to you in time, right? Instead, this is what he writes back. I command you in the name of God, to live because I still have need of you in the work of reforming the church. The Lord will never let me hear that you are dead, but will permit you to survive me. For this I am praying, because I seek only to glorify the name of God. Whoa. That is a powerful and specific prayer, don't you think? What would it be like to engage that part of our Christian faith that we believed with so much power and we prayed so specifically that we saw God answer prayers like these. How awesome would that be? So I know what you're asking. What happened to Myconius? Well, Myconius at this stage when he received this letter couldn't even speak. The doctors at the time said that he has days, days to live. Myconius heard this prayer that Martin Luther prayed for him And suddenly, he began to speak. Suddenly, he got out of bed. And suddenly, he went back to working to help Luther reform the church. Now, here's the incredible thing. You ready for this? Do you know when Myconius died? Six years later. That's not the most most incredible part. He died six years later, two months after Martin Luther died. He outlived Martin Luther. I mean, how cool is that when you realize that when you believe and have faith and pray with power and specificity that God desires, listen, bold prayers honor God, and God honors bold prayers. Bold prayers declare to God that you believe that he is the only one that can do it. We have to stop praying for the things that only we can do and start praying for the things that only he can do. We have to start getting to a place in our prayer lives that we realize, God, I know you're going to use me. God, I know that and I desire to be used. But Lord, I need you to use me in such a way that when people see me, they see you. When they see our church, they don't see Trinity Church at, Trinity, at 1451 Raymond Drive. They see the power of God working in the kingdom. That's where we need to get to in praying powerfully and specifically. You know, Luther didn't say, Lord, be with my friend Myconius right? He didn't even pray, Lord, heal my friend Myconius. He didn't pray that prayer. He says, I command you in the name of God. Now, here's the thing. Do you know why we don't pray these types of prayers? Because we're afraid of God's answer. Because we're afraid of God's answer. We're afraid that if we pray with such power and such such specificity, that's a tough word, We're afraid that when we pray that way, that if God doesn't come through, and if he doesn't answer it the way that we prayed it, then God has let us down. And we get fearful. And we say, well, I'm just going to pray the prayers that I think and believe that God will answer. No. Listen, God answers your prayers every single time. You just have to be okay that sometimes the answer is no. He answers our prayer every single time. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, and sometimes it's wait. And we have to be okay with that. But it doesn't change the fact and the power in which we pray. It doesn't change the intensity by which we pray and the desire by which we pray and the faith and the, and the belief that we have when we pray. Pastor Katie hit the nail on the head in her prayer, or before the prayer when she said, what she's learning is that if you come expecting and anticipating of what God is going to do, boy, does it change your prayer life. How awesome is that? 
Luther prayed with power and he prayed with specificity. And who got the glory? Who got the glory? God. Everybody knew that Martin Luther didn't heal Myconius, right? They knew it wasn't him. All of a sudden, Myconius gets up, he starts speaking, he starts going back to reforming the church. He lives for six more years. You know, every time Myconius walked down the street, people were going, miracle. <laughs> right? Right? And they're not going, wow, Martin Luther is amazing. No. They're going, look how incredible God is. Look how incredible God is. God got the glory. John 14, 13 tells us that you can ask for anything in my name, meaning Jesus. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. So when we pray, a part that we can add into our prayer is, God, our desire is that when we, when we do these things, that it will bring glory to you, not to me, but bring glory to to you. So let's go to the scripture, Ephesians chapter 3. It's page 896 in your pew Bibles. And I'm actually going to cheat this morning. I'm going to use the NIV um, because the, the word so that, which is the, the, which is the intention of our series, appears in the NIV. So I'm going to have, uh, I'm actually going to have the scripture up on the screen in the NIV, but you can follow along whatever translation that you're reading. So we start in verse 14 of chapter 3. He says, Paul, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. Now let's stop there for a second. What's interesting about this posture that Paul is taking is it's a little bit different than what he's used to. Paul, if you remember, grew up um, in a Jewish understanding. He was, he was a rabbi. He was rabbinical. He studied under the greatest rabbis in the teaching of the time. And when they would stand to pray, they would stand like this. They would stand with their heads lifted high or heads lifted or low, and they would stand with their hands outstretched and their palms to the sky. This is the typical stance of prayer that they would take. Paul here is saying, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. Now, put your, put your, spirit, your scriptural educational hats on for a minute. Why do you believe that he's kneeling before his Father? What does that posture mean? What does that look like? Humility, right? So kneeling before the Father, he's humbling himself. We learn this actually from Jesus as well. If we just take the, the scene of Jesus in the garden before he's about to be betrayed and hung on the cross, Jesus kneels before his Father and he prays. And if you remember, he gets up and he goes back to the disciples and he says, can't you guys stay awake for more than five minutes? Seriously, right? And then he goes back and what does it say? As he went on further, he fell to his face, which is another posture of prayer. Another posture of prayer isn't, it's standing with our palms lifted high. It's, it's sitting before the Lord. It's kneeling in humble adoration and lowering our heads down to the ground, or it's literally laying out what's called prostrate and, and laying out and getting as low as you possibly can to the ground because you desire God to do a work far greater than you can ask for or imagine. So verse 15, it says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray, this is Paul, I pray that out of his what? Say it with me. Glorious riches that he may strengthen you with what? Say it with me. Power through his spirit in your inner being. I pray that out of his glorious riches that he will strengthen you with power, power through his spirit. I want you to think about it this way. Think about this like the glorious riches of God, like a well. I want you to consider it. What does it look like, God's glorious riches as a well? It means it's limitless. It doesn't have a bottom. It means that we can come, and he wants to supply out of his glorious riches power to us. And, and the, the trouble is, it's, it's easy for us to kind of visualize and realize that God's unlimited power and limitless well of glorious riches is something that we can draw from. We can get there. We can see that. But the problem for us is often we show up at the well 
with a cup. Um, hey, JC. <laughs> How's it going, man? How are you? Oh, man. I, I, I came to pray and, and to get some water from, from the, the, the well of God. That's awesome. But, um, you know, I brought, I brought my cup. I brought my cup, but uh, I see that you brought a much bigger container. What is that? Well, I don't, I don't you see, understand. Uh, <clears throat> the God of well is limitless. And, you see, when we pray, we're, we're tapping in this stream of unlimited power. Oh, okay. And, and so, so what was this? <coughs> Pastor, yeah. mm-hmm. don't you read your Bible? Uh, <laughs> you see, uh, the scripture tells us. Yeah, scripture. You know this. Uh-huh. The scripture tells us that um, <clears throat> we all were blessed by all the uh, spiritual blessings in, in the heavenly realms. In the heavenly realms? All, all, of the, all of the heavenly realms. We've been blessed. Yeah. And, 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 and the question now, Pastor, for you is, what are you doing with this? This, this is so tiny. I, well, I, I thought that what I could do is I, I could just come to the well and I'll just lean don't, over. Don't, don't you right? fall. And then don't, oh, you wait, fall. Wait, don't you fall. Wait. Don't you fall. Okay. Don't you oh. fall. It's a good save. That's a good save. So what you're telling me is my cup is too small. Yeah. That's yep. what you're saying. Yep, 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 yep. See? And this is unlimited power, and unlimited glorious riches are down there. And man, you came prepared. You gotta get yourself a bigger container, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> That's the difference. We need to get ourselves a bigger container. We need to realize that God's glorious riches are unlimited. His power is unlimited. It's limitless. That well you will never find the bottom of. And, and so for us this morning, when we look at this, we go, we, we look at James 4, verses 2 and 3, and it says, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask. That word ask is aiteo in Greek. Everybody say aiteo. Listen to what the meaning of this is. It's beg, call for, crave, desire. He he tells us right here, James, who was the brother of Jesus, says, yet you don't have what you want because you don't crave, you don't desire, you don't beg God for it. And even when you do ask, even when you do desire and crave and beg, here's the thing, you don't get it. Because your motives are all wrong. Again, when we enter into that throne room of grace, which earlier in Ephesians 3, it says that we can approach with confidence. Approach with confidence. When we do, God isn't necessarily just listening to the words that we say to him. He is looking directly into our hearts. He knows the motive of our heart. He knows what we're bringing to the table. When we want and desire God to do incredible things, he's going to look into our heart to see if our motives are correct. So we go back to Ephesians 3. Paul is specifically praying that God would strengthen us out of his glorious riches and strengthen us with power through the Spirit. That word power in the Greek is dunamis. Everybody say dunamis. It's it's actually derived from the word dunamai. Everybody say dunamai. Does that sound familiar to you? Dunamai, meaning power. In English, it's where we get the word dynamite. Dynamite. So when you see the word power, as Paul writes it here, you can think of the power that is displayed in dynamite. It's powerful. It gets ability. It means strength. So we get to verse 17, which is kind of the tipping point, and for us is the whole purpose of this series. So that... So that, so all the things that Paul prayed for us and all the things he's praying for you leads up to this. So that Christ may dwell, meaning having permanent residence, in your hearts through what? Faith. Faith is a huge aspect. 
In fact, uh, we've been studying this a little bit on Wednesday nights and looking at the fact that how often it was the faith of a person that healed them. How often it was that, that Jesus didn't look just at what they were saying or what they needed. He would ask them, what do you need? He goes up to blind Bartimaeus and he says, blind Bartimaeus, what can I do for you? And I would love it if Bartimaeus was like, duh. You know my name is blind Bartimaeus. I'm blind. I could really use sight right now. That would be really cool. But Jesus says, blind Bartimaeus, what can I do for you? Because he wanted blind Bartimaeus to be ready to tell him what he needed. And then blind Bartimaeus told him, and he says, what does he say to him? He says, your faith has healed you. Faith is a huge part when we pray. He says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power, again, strength, power, ability, together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Here's the amazing thing. We only scratch the surface of recognizing how deep and wide and long and high the love of Christ is on our own. We can't even get there on our own. We need the love of God in us. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us for us to be able to even scratch the surface to see how long, how wide, and how high and deep the love of God is. It's revealed to us supernaturally. See, the good news is, concerning God's love, it's wide enough to include every person. It's long enough to last through all eternity. It's high enough to take up to take us up to the heavenly heights, and it's deep enough to reach the worst of sinners. That's God's love. Uh, there's been many people that have translated and have tried to understand the four aspects of this love, high, deep, wide, and long. And I've heard, uh, I've heard other commentators and, and, or have read other commentators and have heard other pastors talk about that being like the symbol of the cross, the symbol of the cross, the cross, it's limitless. It reaches as high and as low, and it reaches as wide and as long as it takes in order to reach those who are lost. That's the beauty of God's love and how it is displayed on the cross. Verse 19, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Well, there you go. The good news is, is we are not smart enough to be able to comprehend God's love. That we need God in order to start comprehending God's love. And so it surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. Whoa. Wait a minute. Being filled with any measure of God is going to be a lot. And it's going to be pretty intense. Now Paul's saying, I desire for you to be filled with, uh, to the measure of all the fullness of God. Could you imagine what that would be like? Could you imagine what it would be like to live a life where you are filled literally with the full measure of God's love? How that would spill out and permeate everywhere? Excuse me, you got God's love on me. You, you step, just please, please step over there. God's love is just permeating you, you know. Would you please stop speaking? God's love just keeps coming out right? You know what? You stink. You smell like God's love, right? Could you imagine that? Could you imagine God's love being so incredibly powerful in our lives that consumes every part of who we are? How cool would that be? It, it's like, it's uh, uh, Peyton's favorite restaurant. She loves going to Olive Garden. Yesterday, um, I'm a proud father, and I have a, a proud mother as well. Um, Peyton scored her first goal in soccer. It was an incredible moment. It was an incredible moment moment. I mean, like, literally, you know, everybody else is just kind of, yay, we got to go. Kaylee and I were like, yeah, <laughs> you know, like dancing around the chairs, high-fiving each other. <laughs> Peyton's like, guys, seriously, seriously, what's wrong with you two? So we said to her, Peyton, you got your first goal in soccer. Where do you want to go? And so, of course, she said, well, I want to go to either Olive Garden or Maggiano's. I was like, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. <coughs> See, but she loves going to Olive Garden for the Parmesan cheese. 
For her, it's all about the cheese. And you know when the Olive Garden uh, waitress comes over to your table and they say, would you like cheese on that? My daughter actually puts out a whole plate. <laughs> Start filling, right? And she, the waitress starts cranking on the cheese, right? And it starts piling up and piling up. And then the, like, all, there's that one part where the waitress looks at us, look at, like, should I keep going? And, you know, Peyton's like, come on. <laughs> come on. And, you know, they're trained. They'll keep going until you say what? When or stop, right? I, I always love going to diners because you go to diners and you get your mug of coffee and all of a sudden they start filling it up. And I love the, I love the service. I can do the tall pour. You ever seen the tall pour? You know, they're like, whoop, and they like raise it up. I'm like, you are a pro. And, and then, you know, and if they're like old school, they'll say to you now, say when, when you're, you know, and I, like, there's always just one little part of me that was like, I wonder if I don't say when, if they'll just keep going. Because what will happen to the, to the cup? It'll start to overflow, right? It'll start to overflow. So think about that in relationship to our prayer life. You see, when we go and enter into God's prayer, and we enter into God's powerful time of prayer, and we enter into the throne room, guess what he starts doing? He starts filling us, and filling us, and filling us, and filling us, until we say, when? See, because here's the amazing thing. We can control how much or how little we want of that power. God's power is unlimited. His desire for you is, is to is to come alongside and to bless you richly. And so when we come to him, we have the ability and desire to say, God, I want more, I want more, I want more. Here's the good news, folks. You can't pray too much. You can't show me anywhere in the Bible where God was like, oh, okay, oh, okay, we, you've reached your prayer quota. No more prayer for you. It's not in there because you can't pray enough. But the reverse of that is very true. You can pray too little. You can't pray enough, but you can pray too little. So for us, when we, when we look at what Jesus is doing and in the power of prayer, we have to realize, you know, Scripture even communicates to us that we are to pray without ceasing. And again, I know that that goes back to, for some of us, that intimidating part how do I pray without ceasing? I mean, like, nonstop all the time, dear Lord. I pray as I'm driving in my car. You know, I mean, like, or, or I'm at the DMV. That's a good time to pray, by the way. <laughs> pray away at the DMV. You know, Lord, I pray this line goes faster, you know. But then sometimes God might say to you, no, no, because I want the person that sits next to you to hear your story. Boom. Because that's the reality when we pray. God opens up doors that we can't open on our own. So praying too much is like saying that you can drink too much coffee. It's just not possible. Or it's like saying, it's like saying you can eat too much chocolate, right? Again, not possible. Or like saying that you could overhate Ohio State. It's, it's, just, it's just not possible. It's not possible. You can always pray more and God desires for us to pray more. I love you, Ohio State fans. <laughs> we need to stop praying general prayers. What would that look like? What if? What if we stopped praying general prayers? What if we prayed more specifically? What if we just added two words to our prayer life? And that's your homework this week. Your homework this week, you're like, I didn't come to church to get homework. Oh, buddy. <laughs> yes, you did today. I want you to add two words to your prayer life this week. So that. So that. Because when we pray, we want to pray with boldness and power, and we also want to be specific. Lord, I pray so that. And what do we want the desired result to be? Let me ask you this this morning. What is it that you need to specifically bring to God this morning? What is it for you? Nobody else can answer that. You can't look at your neighbor. You can't talk to the person next to you. It's yours. What is it for you? You would say this morning, I need to pray specifically for this in my life. See, the bottom line is general prayers don't move God to specific action. 
We need to stop praying general prayers for our children. Lord, I pray that you would keep them from drugs. I mean, that's a good prayer. I don't want to take that prayer away from anybody, but what would it look like if we prayed with more power and we were more specific and we said, God, raise them up to be warriors. Raise them up with the full armor of God that you will protect them from the evil one, Lord, that they will be leaders in their school, that they won't succumb to all the pressures and temptations around them because you are the center of their heart, because you desire to do a work far greater in them than I could even do on my own. So that, Lord, that they'll be protected from the drug culture. And when people come to them, Lord, that they won't, they won't be pulled away because you are strong in them. What if we started to, to pray for our lost children with the same power and being specific? I mean, we can't just say, Lord, be with my lost children. I know they're far from you right now. But what if we said, God, place people in front of them. Lord, I call out their name right now. I want their name to rattle around in the throne room of grace. I want you, God, to reach down right now, to put a burden on their heart, to let them know that they are far from you, that you would place people around them, Lord, that you would help them to come back to you. Lord, I pray that if we do have those opportunities, you would give me wisdom. You would give me the words to be able to speak life into them, Lord Jesus. What if, what if we said, no, God, we're going to pray with power. We're going to pray with boldness. We're going to believe and have faith that not only what we pray is something that we pray that comes from you, but we're going to believe that you're going to answer that prayer. That we believe that you're going to answer that prayer. We pray for our finances. Lord, I pray for my finances. I pray that you would, you would help me. I mean, but what if we understood the power of Scripture that when he says, I, neither will I leave you nor will I forsake you, he's talking about our finances. You say, Lord, you told me that I would never have to beg for a crumb of bread. And so, Lord, I pray for my finances. I know that it takes responsibility on my part. And I pray, Lord, that you give me the opportunities to be faithful to you in those moments. I pray, Lord, that, that your spirit would reign over my checkbook, that I would stop realizing that this is done on my own strength and by my own power, but, Lord, I relinquish control to you. I give you my checking account. I give you my job. I give you my, my family, Lord, because I desire so that you can reign supreme over every aspect of my life. There's a prayer at Trinity that God answers 100% of the time. And I've seen it. And I'm, I will admit to you this morning that we have stopped praying it. Every time that we have prayed for God to reach his hand out across to Raymond Drive and to draw people unto himself through this church, we have seen people literally walk in off of the street and we have asked them, why are you here? What drew you here? And the only response they can give you is God. And we as a church have got to stop praying general prayers for our church. Lord, bless our church. He's knocking on our door saying, do you see where you guys worship? Do you see what you have in front of you? Do you see all the opportunities? Instead, we need to get specific about praying for our neighborhood, praying for our community, Praying for your neighbors. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would move in a mighty, powerful way, that your Holy Spirit would go out of this place, that this place would get brighter and brighter as the world around us gets dimmer and dimmer. Lord, I pray that you would go out onto Raymond Drive and you would draw people in. Lord, that you would do a miraculous work, that the only way that we could explain it is by your power, your glory, your Holy Spirit doing a work in this community and in this church. Lord, we want to pray specifically right now that you would begin to raise up leaders in this church, Lord. Not just leaders that, that say they're going to lead, but leaders that are going to give everything that they have to follow your will, to do whatever it takes, Lord, so that lost people can be found so that salvation can be experienced. Lord, I pray specifically this morning that your transformational power would be experienced in such a mighty way that when people walk into the doors of the sanctuary before a note is sung or a note is played, your transformational Holy Spirit has been here and is at work and they will experience salvation before we even say anything. 
Lord, we want to pray that prayer specifically this morning so that you will receive the glory. So that this world will be transformed. So that we'll see the drug culture in Naperville drop. So that we'll see the domestic violence in our neighborhoods go down. So that we'll see our young people raise up and make a difference in the world around them. Lord, we pray this with great power this morning. In the late 1800s, I'm going to end with this story. It was the middle to the late 1800s, and, and uh, there was an evangelist and a missionary named George Mueller. George Mueller was, uh, was the leader of the Ashley Downs um, orphanages in England, and it, they were named after their location in Bristol, England. And George Mueller was a person who, by the end of his life, had reached 10,000 people. Or I'm sorry, 10,000 orphans were cared for by George Mueller. 10,000. Actually, there was more than that. More than 10,000 orphans were cared for by George Mueller and the homes that he established. Here's the amazing thing. George Mueller never asked a person for a dime. Never asked a person for a dime. He never raised any money for his ministry. Instead, he prayed very specific and very quiet prayers. And then he stood back and he watched God work. He watched God do incredible things. When George Mueller died, this is amazing. This was like I had to actually double check this stat. When George Mueller died, they found over 50,000 recorded answers to prayer in his journals. He wrote down every specific, God-honoring, bold prayer. And when he died, they were able to verify over 50,000 recorded answers to prayer. George Mueller has done amazing things to impact the power of prayer in people's lives. And especially missionaries on the mission field and evangelists. What would it look like, church, if we started to pray with power and prayed specifically? What if we started to write down the prayers that we desire for God to answer? I can tell you from personal experience, I love seeing post-it notes on a wall that says prayer and then praises and answered prayers and moved around the wall, because praying specifically for people and watching God answer those prayers. We don't need to be fearful of what God is going to say. We need to be fearful of the, of the fact that we're not saying it. We need to approach the throne room of grace with confidence and come and boldly proclaim with power. So that even in those moments, we'd be filled with the full measure of God's love. What is it that you need this morning? What is it that you specifically need to pray boldly and specifically to God about? In the bulletin this morning, there is a card. And that card is just going to serve as an instruction for you this week. You don't need to fill it out right now. I want you to take it with you. If you don't have one or if you didn't grab a bulletin, we've got extras on the table in the back. And I want us to, I want us to just do this homework this week. Add those two words to your prayer life. Pray for power, pray with power, and add so that, so that. Can we do that? So this morning as we close, um, there was a song that we sang earlier in the service called Give Me Faith. And I love the, the, the bridge of that song is Give Me Faith. Um, my flesh may be weak, but your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. And so as we proclaim that and we proclaim the promise of that this morning, would you stand? And I just want to invite you to take whatever posture of prayer that you want this morning. 
if you want to come forward and you've got a request that you want to take to God and you want people to pray with you, we will be glad to do that. I'll, I'll be standing down here. I'll pray with anybody who wants to come. You can gather at the altar. If you just want to turn around and make your, your pew an altar of prayer and you want to pray specifically and boldly to God this morning, you can do that as well. We're just going to close by singing this song and then we'll go on our way. Amen? Let's go to him. Gracious Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you're about to do. We're thankful this morning that that we can hear the promise, that we can never pray too much. But Lord, I pray this morning that we would come and we would have a, a specific prayer that we desire for you to answer. And I pray, Lord, that we'd be like the persistent widow that wouldn't give up, but we would keep praying it and keep praying it and keep praying it, basically giving you no option but to answer our prayer, Lord. We believe that this morning that bold prayers honor you and that you honor bold prayers. So we pray this morning for the same power that Paul prayed over the church, that out of your glorious riches, you would bestow that power on us. And that when we experience that power, we would then have the ability that which surpasses even our knowledge to understand how deep and wide and long and high of your, what your love is for us. So, Lord, we come. We come confidently into the throne room of grace, and we bring our prayers and petitions to you. I may be weak, but your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail, but by God you never Your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail. My God, you never will. I may be weak. Your spirit is strong.
end with the benediction. The benediction is actually going to come from the end of that chapter, chapter 3, verses um, uh, 20 and 21, at the end of that section. And it says, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we than all we ask or imagine. Let me say that again. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask. So that means even in our prayers, he can do more than what we even ask for. Immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work where? Within us. His power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all of God's people together said, Amen. I'm going to ask this morning that you would just go quietly and you're dismissed now. If you want to stay and pray, please stay and pray. And uh, let's boldly proclaim this week, so that, so that. And we'll see you back here next week.